I began writing in 2005 and this is one of the first poems I ever wrote um, and it was a memory of uh, helping my grandmother make bread when I used to visit her as a child. Daily bread. A white mist rises as she sifts a pound of flour into the worn tin basin wide as Loch Carob. Blue veins lie like rivers on the map of her hands. She measures one teaspoon of bread soda, two teaspoons of salt, the plait of the nape of her neck, a fisherman's rope coiled at the quay. She scoops a hollow, pours a pint of buttermilk splashing and spluttering into the well. With the rhythm of a rower, she kneads rough dough on the flour-dusted table, pushing it away, pulling it back, pushing it away again. With her wrist, she flicks a lock, silver-grey frost in December from her high cheek bones readying the bread for its hot harbour, she cuts a deep cross. I, I grew up the uh, Church of Ireland in the west of Ireland and um, the King James Bible and the hymns we listened to, uh, I think now had a big influence on my writing even though I only began to write much, much later in life. But I think the rhythms, but also the metaphors in the Bible and the hymns uh, were very influential. Uh, so I'd like to read a poem that came out of thinking about that influence. The Blue Bible. Before breakfast, we'd kneel on the kitchen tiles for prayers. Then listen to our father read a lesson from the Blue Bible with sticking plaster along its spine, a picture beside each story. We took turns to choose the Good Samaritan, Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree, the loaves and fishes that grew and grew to feed the multitudes. Stories for people who worked the soil, who watched over flocks of sheep. We knew those people. We knew the rain that ruined crops, the seed that fell on stony ground, the days when hope, like a restless heifer, goes astray. And uh, this poem is for my partner, Isabel, and I wrote it for our civil partnership uh, in, in 2011. And it, it was to capture the very, the difference it, it made uh, to be uh, having our, what was like a marriage, 20 years after we got together so that it wasn't with the naivety perhaps or the innocence of getting married after three or four years together. We already knew each other very well and I wanted to uh, just capture that in this poem. Vows. I can't promise it's chiselled from gold in spirals that speak of forever. I can't tell you it's wise as a mountain with pines that reach for heaven. I can't promise it's flawless as honey gathered by bees in bell heather. I can't say it's simple as silk spun from cocoon into treasure. But I promise it's rooted as rowan with berries that sing to September. I promise it's to and it's fro 
will surprise like Glen Malore weather. A seasoned rowboat, moored or unmoored at your pleasure. And uh, this poem is in the form of a villanelle, which I felt really suited the subject matter um, about, I suppose, love, the love for the land that has nothing to do with who owns it, and it's more to do with who works it and walks it and knows it. Who owns the field? Is it the one who is named in the deeds, whose hands never touch the clay? Or is it the one who gathers the sheaves, takes a side to the thistles, plants the beech, digs out the dockweed, lays the live hazel? Is it the one who is named in the deeds, or the one who pulls ragwort on his knees? lifts rocks into a cart, splits larch for stakes, the one who gathers the sheaves, slashooks the briars, scatters the seed, cuts his hand on barbed wire, hangs the gate. Is it the one who is named in the deeds, or the one who could surely lead to where children made a hiding place in an old lime tree? He gathers the sheaves. Is it the one who tends cattle and sheep and can tell you how the field got its name? Is it the one who is named in the deeds or the one who gathers the sheaves? So this poem is uh, very much about um, emigration and particularly the emigration of Irish women to the States. And after I read this poem, I got, after The River was published, I had an email uh, from a woman who's now in Australia, an Irish woman. And she said in her email, I was one of the 40,000 young people who left Ireland in 1960. On the boat. On the boat, we were mostly virgins. We talked about who we were going to be. Waitresses, seamstresses, nurses. We didn't talk about why we had to leave. We talked about where we were going to be. The wooden frame house with a picket fence. But we didn't talk about why we had to leave as we touched the lockets around our neck. The wooden frame house with a picket fence led to talk of lost villages, lost streets, as we touched the lockets around our necks. We didn't foresee tenements that grew thick as trees when we talked of lost villages, lost streets, and the diligent men we were going to marry. We didn't foresee tenements that grew thick as trees, the suitcase of memories we would have to carry to the diligent men we were going to marry when we were waitresses, seamstresses, nurses, nor the suitcase of memories we would have to carry from the boat where we were mostly virgins. And um, the title poem of the river is also the last poem in the collection. And it's the poem that I read at nearly every reading, but it's also the poem to which I've got most response uh, in terms of people writing to me about it, requesting it, texting me about it. And I suppose it's the poem maybe that has had most resonance for other people. Uh, but it also has most resonance for myself and it explores the nature of grieving, the river. What surprises me now 
is not that you're gone, but how I go on without you, as if I had lost no more than a finger. My hand, still strong, perhaps stronger, can do what it must, like carving your name on a branch from the beach by the suck letting the river take you so I can call myself free. Only sometimes, like yesterday or the day before or last night or this morning, the river flows backwards uphill to my door.